as revolutionary or as changing, but actually, this is the greatest possibility, the greatest opportunity really is right now. It is, I mean, okay, on the issue of accountancy, we're being held to account by the people who pay for this place, not by the electors. Okay, so maybe that's a, an issue to do with the strength of the electors, but it's also to do with the strength of, of us all. Okay. As a revolution, that's the purpose, is to increase the amount of strength that the electors have over the people who pay for it. We're being held to be by account by people who really aren't accountable, apart from by them. Um, on the issue of transparency, transparency is another name for a stick. Right? We want to beat the hell out of whoever wins this election. Uh, uh, actually, no, we don't. What we want is somehow to get account uh, accountability when we don't think there is. But really, it's simply an issue to do with how do we make people do what we need them to do? And I think this leads very well into the final answer, which is that we need to, as Gala says, support people. It seems really obvious, but the amount of support for unions, for its members, through its unions, by Yulu, is almost zero. I can't think of anything. I mean, nothing. Okay, so. Having its own house in order is really an obvious one, but getting other people's houses in order so that they can then help each other, help facilitate each other, seems the most obvious answer. But to me, the most important part is the continuation of inequalities based upon, firstly, education. Okay. After that, you've got sexism, racism, homophobia, and geography. I know geography has caused a lot of inequality, but I guess it's because people that are talking about it are yeah, have a bad time. But the issue is, this is in London, so that's not an issue. The one principal reason for the continuation of massive levels, worse only by Portugal in America, of inequality and continuing multi-generational inequality, multi-generational child poverty, like where I live, it's 45% multi-generational child poverty. Don't teach kids how to read away, it makes no difference. Two times out of five. Okay, is education. I think the quality of education in these places is just shameful. I mean, it's wrong. It's the cause of inequality. Liberation, okay, when education finally gets to the point where liberation is effective, the rest of it falls into place. Okay, there is no way you're ever, ever going to sort anything out if black people's social, economic, and environmental outcomes are worse if they're living 10 times shorter than white people. There's no way you can do anything else, okay, without getting the education done first. Okay, straight people and gay people being treated exactly the same, okay, how can they not be, I mean, is it, an educational issue? Okay, well you could say, well there's traditions of you know, fear and hate, okay, well fine, but those fears and hates have to be part of an educational agenda that is the beginning of the solution. So that's how I'd help the immigration campaign to sort out the quality of the education. Why don't you take the round of open on those trips, what do you think? Um, well, closing speech is that's five, but we'll have a quick game. That minute each. Okay. Uh, one more round, I think. Okay. Any more questions? Yep. The LSE, I think, is currently pays seventy thousand pounds a year to be reviewed. I think it's under. And I prefer the university more. Do you think this is good value for money? And would you seek to raise the cost to lower it a bit? Generally. So, follow on from your question. Have you ever been on an anti-fascism demo? And if not, why not? With uh, the term only being nine months, if you've got one thing that be your legacy, because there's a lot of people with a lot of ideas, in a short time, which one would it be? If there's one thing out of your campaign that could be your legacy, because it's such a short time, which one would it be? I'll take any remaining questions now since it's the last round, so if you want to go anything else. Nope. Right, I'm going to bang this one on the specialist drum. Um, as a as the president of a small specialist institution, uh, what can each of you promise you'll do in order to make sure that uh, the voices of small specialist colleges and their spatter boxes are heard as well as their students in uni? And I score a hand if you get. Yeah. Uh, just want to throw back something that one of the other candidates said to be commented on by all candidates when someone said, I'm not sure whether I'm a violent revolutionary, but it doesn't really matter because your views are supported by the majority of students. I was a little bit worried by that. I wonder if other candidates were worried by it too. I'm not sure about that. Right. I, think, I think we are, we're allowed on the record campaign by the rules. But I, I, that's not what, exactly what I said. Michael, I saw you. 
We are a organisation that should be providing services, and therefore it should be service provided in one direction. So, if there's services that aren't being there and they're being paid for, it does seem a bit pointless. So, it would be nice to have a economically self-sustaining unit, and I think with the levels of services and the location, it should be economically self-sustaining. It shouldn't require any money from any. I mean, apart from a subscription, a minimum subscription, seventy thousand pounds for the LSE. I don't think they get much for their money. Uh, I guess most time. Um, on anti-fascism, yes, I was uh, been to lots, but the last one I went to was Nick Griffin on New, uh, Question Time up at the BBC, and I was stood there with uh, I can't remember his name. I'm Munaf Qureshi, assembly member on one side. Is it? I don't know. He's from West London, so I kind of a bit vague on West London assembly members. And the other side is Monty Goldberg. I don't know if you've ever known Monty. Okay, he's like this 85-year-old communist who's standing for a, like his 20th election. He stands every four years. Uh, and, and so we were the, the front line. It was, it was quite an experience. Um, yeah, apart from the fact that Nick Griffin was on telly that evening, which was really unpleasant. Um, yeah, standing up to fascists is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a a bottom line. It doesn't make any sense to give voice to fascists because they wouldn't give voice to anybody. Um, on legacy. An excellent question. Um, I think that a legacy of handing over has to be people who are able to do it themselves. I mean, I love running around like a mad person, but at the same time, I actually think that people should be able to have that choice. And that right now, people are given virtually no opportunity. So the greatest opportunity, I think, is providing as much facilitation as possible and stuff that is self-sustaining, so that it has to be stuff that can work without, I don't know, my micro governance of it. It has to be stuff that works with ours. So something that hands over, it has to meet that test. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I've set up an operation book sharing, so uh, people can lend each other books. It exists for alumni, so after you've graduated, you've always got it. So I won't be running it when I've graduated, but I'll still be offering my books. Um, and then the smaller specialist, um, Birkbeck College was one of that, uh, came in fifth behind a whole bunch of very small specialist colleges. It's the best in the good bit London, I mean, the, the, the louder voice, okay, you can keep quiet, it's like, we don't need no louder voice, we're the best, you know, it's like, but actually pointing out to people that there's something that they have to offer rather than being, you know, we need help because we're small and specialist. My goodness, who's the greatest people in the world is on all these small and specialist colleges? It's big, you know, we're able to get large amounts done, but in reality, there is more that could be done by small and specialist colleges. I would say that it's the big colleges that need small and specialist colleges input. Not the other country. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think we're first on funding. Um, I can't really talk on spending huge amounts of money, but when we're at Heathrow, we spend very little because we are very small. Um, that's always going to be the problem with a staggered system of funding when you have bigger colleges getting involved that have more money to be able to spend, and you have smaller ones that won't have that money. Um, I mean, £70,000 is double our, our um, student union grant, so there would be no way that we could, we could ever fund that kind of money. Um, also, I tried to have an answer on who decides this, this amount of money that seems to be a bit weird and um, yeah, it, why it went up this year, because it went up from, from last year. Um, asked at Senate, I got the answer, it's UL who decide, and then there's, a, there, there's an agreement there. Talked to UL, they said it was UL. So I'm still waiting on a direct answer of who has the ability to change that, who has the ability to actually have a conversation with as to see how people feel they're getting enough out of it. But the problem is obviously if bigger institutions decide they're not getting enough, does that mean that everyone else can't be a part of ULU? Um, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated situation, um, but I do think it needs looking into and at least needs to be open and there needs to be questions raised and asked about it. But we need to find out exactly who to ask those questions to because I still haven't got a clear answer from either ULU or you will, um, but I'll, I'll try my best to find out about that. Um, second question, uh, fascism march. I haven't been on a fascism march, no. But obviously it's really like serious issue. Um, we, we, we at Heathrow obviously uh, take it as a very serious thing. 
Um, luckily, we haven't had any big incidents um, as yet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yes, it's, it's a very serious, serious thing, so it should always have a kind of zero tolerance approach to that kind of stuff. Um, as for uh, something I'd want to hang my hat on if I was to, uh, to be president and leave a legacy, um, I think it would be having more people vote. I think that's a really important thing. You need to have a mandate if you are running, if you are EU president or if you're EU vice president. If you don't have a mandate, what you say means nothing. If, if no one votes for you, it really doesn't matter what you say. And also, you know, the college, the college and colleges themselves, University of London, London in general, are not going to listen to you if so few people vote. You may as well not be there. I think that that's it. It, it would be it, it's a waste of money otherwise. Um, third question. What was the third question? You've covered three of them already. The fourth one is small inspectors. Oh, small inspectors. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, being Heathrow president last year, I know quite a lot about small specialists. Um, I was my, uh, I was the only SAB, but I managed to win us the second SAB last year, uh, which was great, uh, which meant a bit more support for our students' union. But we don't get that much out of Bulu in the way of support. We actually feel quite drowned out a lot of the time because Bulu colleges can throw their weight around a lot more, even though we have an equal vote. Um, I mean, a, a good example would be something like Lussell. Um, the the uh, the EU leagues have kind of been drowned by Lussell, which was a um, a Bucks creation to rival EU leagues, which has basically killed EU leagues, and because big colleges went, everyone else had to follow. We didn't really get a say as to what happened there, um, because big colleges threw their way behind something. Um, I think the best way to support small and specialist colleges is to support the new uh, small and specialist uh, network, which has been set up, uh, which has actually really helped people get in contact with each other. It has re it's really helped um, small and specialist uh, student unions feel like they've, they've got someone who's ha who has their back. It's allowed them to get more involved with Senate. It's allowed them to proxy vote. So even if they can't be there because they're really busy, maybe they don't have any SABs, or maybe they've only got one SAB and so you're working full time. So taking that much time out of your day, especially if you're far away, is difficult. Um, so they're, they're still allowed to vote and they can still state what they feel on certain things so that their voice is heard. Um, in terms of funding, what's led you to ask that question is because you're in part of a society whereas you find you're not getting services delivered to you from UD? Because in terms of what Gala said, losing the leagues is a huge, is a huge thorn. It's not even a thorn, it's actually written in one of the central pillars out of UD's existence in terms of the justification for survival, the justification for funding. So what, what was your... Well, it's something like less than 1% of LSE students use yeah. UD for anything whatsoever and yet we pay a relatively large amount. Do you think that's value for money? Well, if people aren't using it, then it's not value for money. But why are they not using it is the main key question as to what we should be trying to cover as SABs next year. Um, I was down at LSE last night, and you're right, they didn't, the people buying the bar didn't know there was any hustings tonight, they know that theirs are tomorrow, I was told. And all there was, there was flyers everywhere about your stuff was absolutely nothing. So, you know, that's, that's it. It's part of the education, it's part of making sure that people actually know what you is doing. Why is Yulu important to them? Why could it be important to them? We're trying to create that, that interest in each of the individual colleges to know that we're here for you. Not above you like an umbrella, like this umbrella thing you hear about, you know, UL's above you, but along the side we're a bracket, we're there for you to use, we're here to serve you in essence. But no, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't just reel off figures and tell you, to, can I justify X, Y and Z, because from what I know about in terms of the services for 18 months in terms of the leagues, they just, they just fell apart and people rightfully looked at another option, perhaps, and they found it, same money, and now Yulu's trying to reel them back, which I think is an impossible task. Possibly something we've got to have to try and sort out. Um, in terms of the fascists, no, I've never been to any demonstrations in that way. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do is make sure that I'm going to give some apolitical representation to student interests when I'm actually in office. So you are actually leading, where, and I will try and facilitate. So if students want things to happen, then we're trying to react to that in terms of reaction and reaction. And that's also increasing the, term, the communication with each of the colleges, each of the institutions. Because at the moment, it doesn't seem, it seems like we're all just on separate islands, and very few actually have any sort of recognition of what's going on at ULU, as well as their own college. So I think it's very important that we actually have those communication lines so we can know what's going on, know what's important to colleges. For instance, Central, you know, when they want to go out about the arts, they don't necessarily feel that other colleges will support them. Well, why not? We should all feel part of the same thing. We're all part of the student body. Um, in terms of the thing, the legacy, if you will, sounds a bit grandiose to be quite honest. Um, I'd, if Yulu can survive, if we can make sure that we created something so we can all communicate more, that people can feel more part of Yulu, and then 
great, other great things that have been mentioned, like housing, etc., will have the opportunity to flourish. First of all, we've got to make sure we're on a surer financial footing, look at, look at avenues of that, be that with alumni, be that with associate memberships, be that in other ways. That's what we have to look at to try and make sure you is still here, because the more it becomes self-funding, the less colleges may think it's a drain, and the more relevance it will become in terms of students, because they'll see you doing these things, and they'll understand it, it's up to us to make sure they know why we're doing things, as well as what we're doing. And uh, small specialist colleges, the fact that you are sat, I think, is probably quite a sad thing that you feel you need to make sure that your actually voice is heard as opposed to it is heard, period, that's it, done. Each of the colleges has equal rights, as far as I'm concerned, to be heard. That's the idea of the Senate. Each one's now had one vote. But I know the way it pans out is that sometimes a larger institution, somehow, despite what happens in the Senate, may well end up getting its own way, from what I've been told. So no, that is wrong, and we have to make sure that everyone understands that we are part of something greater, and that is the University of London Union. Okay, so <clears throat> the value for money question is interesting. Um, it's interesting, it's kind of dangerous, I guess. So all the colleges, um, there's actually those affiliation fees come through the college rather than through the students' union. So another way of putting this is, if those colleges stop paying that 70 grand, would that money go to students' union so they can better spend it in their students' union? Actually, a lot, of, a lot of colleges may well just keep the money. So in a way, um, no, actually, if you're, if you're LSE and you're paying 70 grand and 1% of your student population, you're not getting value for money. But I think we have to look at, a value for money in, in broader terms. Uh, Yulu is, is, not, is not just a place where services are. Yulu is a representative structure for students uh, across London. It's the only one that exists, in my opinion, it should include much more, many more universities than it currently does. Um, and as well as saying, are we getting value for money in terms of services, which is a question, but I think perhaps a minor question to the major question, and the major question is, what would happen if that money withdrew? What would happen if you disappeared? And actually the answer to that is a bit of a disaster. We wouldn't have a coordinating body across London for any of the campaigns that we want. Um, there wouldn't be SABs, two SABs, which is far too few, who are somehow vaguely in the middle of things. Yulu at the moment is, a, is, is very inadequate to a lot, lot of the things that it does, but it's worth having and it's worth preserving. So yes, I agree, in terms of pure services, LSE, college, managers can look at it and say they're not getting value for money. The real question is, what's the real value of Yulu? And I think we've got to fight for Yulu to continue to exist. Have I ever been on an anti-fascist demo? If not, why not? Um, I've never been on a UAF demo, much to my shame, though I have meant to go many times, but always ended up somewhere else on the Saturday it was going on. I've taken part in street demonstrations that have confronted fascists. So outside the TUC demo um, at Manchester Tory Party Conference, I forget which year, but it was the last academic year, um, I, there, were, there were a group of, of, of uh, essentially, as far as I could work out, like far-right BNP supporting uh, people who confronted us. Uh, I was on a Palestine Solidarity demonstration once, and um, there were people there from the EDL waving um, Israeli flags, which is a, a very, very bizarre kind of um, political alliance. But in any case, I've been part of um, people who have confronted fascists in the streets. Though, much to my shame and regret, I've never been on a UAF demo. I will as president, and I, I have intended to on several occasions, I've, I've just been able to work. Um, in terms of my politics on fascism, I support their platform policy unequivocally. Uh, the people who died in the 20th century did not die because their debating skills were somehow not as good as everyone else's. They died, people, people died and the crimes of fascism occurred because once fascists were allowed into the system to exploit it, um, horrible things happened. And I think we've got to be very, very clear that the, the right of students to have a safe space on campus, the right of, uh, of, of students who are women, who are, who are black, who are LGBT, who are disabled, to have a safe space to feel like they are not under attack on their campus will never be trumped by Nick Griffin's right to freedom of speech. Uh, we don't have to invite fascists onto our campus, and I don't think we should. Um, one key priority. Um, I, I've talked a lot about policy and, and housing. I've done that. So I think maybe if I was to be remembered for a legacy about you, um, I would like to be remembered as, a, as somebody who sort of saved Yulu, but I don't think that's a single-handed job. I think that the, I think, and I, and I think it, it's dishonest, uh, it would be dishonest to me and dishonest for anyone to come in here and say, we want to be the person who saved Yulu. Everyone wants to be that person. There's whole, there are dozens of people who want to be those people. Personally, I think that the, 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 the structural thing that Yulu has to become is a London Students' Union for all higher education universities and colleges in, in, in London, not just the University of London. That's an enormously difficult and complex job. 
But for as long as the majority of students in London, in places like University of East London, in London Met, um, in the London South Bank University, for as long as these people are not in ULU, ULU will, be, will not be the organisation it could be. It will not be a students' union for London. That's what it has to become. So that's, in a way, what I'd like to um, move ULU in the direction of doing. And there are huge complications in doing that. I fully accept that. Um, small and specialists. Um, yes, um, small and specialists still feel excluded, they feel undervalued, um, and, and they feel like their voice is drowned out by horrible big institutions like UCL uh, and King's. Um, that's, that's fair enough, and especially in terms of resources, uh, that's often true. Um, small and specialist unions are actually somewhere where you can walk in and a bit of energy and elbow grease can actually get some results. So actually, Often it is about visiting campuses a lot, often it is about making sure that leaflets and posters are around and doing the basics of communications, which so often ULU has failed to do. I think I want to create ULU as a space where resources can be pooled, where big colleges like UCL, where the Students' Union is very wealthy, contribute towards a collective project, which in effect subsidises the work, uh, or a, co a collective project, which in effect cross-subsidises campaigning activity across London. So actually, I think being part of the Yulu family, quote unquote, is, is a good thing for small specialists. And I want to move it away from um, maybe sort of less sort of throwing their weight around and more kind of working together. It sounds very fluffy, um, but I think pooling resources is a genuine thing. Um, small specialists is obviously more technically the work of the vice president rather than the president, I believe, in the constitution. But um, that's not something I'm going to be held back by um, if I get president. Um, I'm you know, small specialist, it's something I'll focus on a lot. Cheers. <coughs> Sorry, a bit cough. Um, in terms of uh, the question about LSE and, and block marks and the way in which that all works, um, I think that you know, the answer to that is that we have to make sure that every single pound and penny that you spend on behalf of the students is open to scrutiny and is spent in an effective way. And that doesn't mean on campaigns that small groups of students want. For instance, campaigns that might alienate people who think on one side or the other of, of Palestine or Israel debate. Um, so I think, uh, equally, that's, if I'm honest, that's a very technical question, and I'm one of the few people who has an, or one of the, at least a couple of past SAMs. I've never been a special officer. I'm not on this constant train of being a SAM as long as I possibly can. Um, I just want to do this because I have some views. Um, in terms of anti-fascism, I would strongly commend Hope Not Hate is a brilliant group that I um, follow and support. Um, I have been known on occasion after a few drinks in the pub to heckle fascists. Call that a one-man march if you want, um, but like in terms of the no platform, and the no platform policy, um, I probably have a more complicated view on this, um, which I can go into in more detail if people want to ask me a more specific question. Um, but essentially, a compromise between not letting these people indoctrinate on campuses and realizing that students are mature and this is a place for academic debate, and in particular, if we can use you know bright people from the University of London to show how seriously stupid Nick Griffin is just as a human being, it just entirely, um, then, then we can do that. But equally, there's, there should, it should be within the structure of free speech and free debate, so you have, should have people arguing against him, and you can't just have you know, one guy coming into a, a room and, and telling people what they should think. So um, that's probably a bit more nuanced than the other arguments, we've, uh, like maybe one argument we've had. Um, in terms of my one key priority, like, I would want to finish the year without having alienated a single student in the University of London. By doing that, I'm very, I'm very much more about how we can form the structures. So I'm not going to go and you know, fly a red flag or take a stance on an international issue or say that ULU should no longer have Nestle products or anything like that. Instead, what I'm going to do is ensure that every student, and this is, if you want to use the term legacy, more like my project, um, is to ensure that every student has the mechanism for getting their views and their, their opinions represented um, via themselves, by their own voice. So this is my campaign pool idea uh, that I, I want to implement. Um, so not alienating any students, because you know, at the moment, there are motions in uni university unions um, and college unions which are dividing student populations in half across colleges. Issues, for instance, like uh, the Israel Palestine matters, I I issues of international politics rather than issues representing stu the matter of students. Um, I think that we should be talking about how we can make sure that campuses aren't cutting our department's budgets, not about what's happening in Israel and Palestine. Um, possibly quite a radical view there. 
Um, so that would be my priority, would be ensuring I don't alienate a single student by my own political ambitions. Um, and finally, uh, small specialist colleges. I actually disagree. Um, I think that small specialist colleges should use ULU like their home. Um, small specialist colleges are the ones that, to be honest, need ULU the most. Um, other colleges have huge amounts of resources, like UCL, where Michael was a SAB, have huge amounts of resources to spend in whatever way they might see wise. Um, and ULU should be basically the home from home for all small specialist colleges. Um, I think. The interesting thing is, is that a lot of the time we, we talk about student politics in terms of these big three colleges, UCL, King's, LSE, and we ignore all the small colleges that actually are the ones that are cons always consistently topping the league tables and always consistently producing research that demonstrates how diverse and intelligent London University students are. By recognising that and the diversity of students will take a great leap forward. So ULU should be the home away from home for small specialist colleges. Right, now we're going to move on to specific questions uh, for candidates. If I could please ask you to keep it to relevance to this election, so policy, manifestos, or any relevant experience. If I feel, uh, or Adam feels, that your question is too pointed or inappropriate, we won't put it to the candidate. Uh, just line that out now, Sean. Can we ask about stuff they said, like just. Yeah, yeah, on the speaker. Um, Will? Yeah, well, um, when you were speaking about liberation campaigns, you called them lifestyle choices, but I don't, I just want to know what our uh, liberation campaigns which when you thought was a lifestyle choice, because women, black people, only people, and disabled people are the main point. Sure, um, I'm actually very, very grateful you said that, because I said lifestyle and who I am. Um, like, I think it's important not to have any kind of value um, a judgment about the entire issue, particularly if you want to have someone who's elected. So as I said, who a human being is and their lifestyles are two things in which no one should ever judge anyone. So I think I covered that before, but maybe, you know, it wasn't quite as clear as I wanted to be. So um, it's not about, you know, liberation should be about who an individual is and what their lifestyles are. Um, and that means that, you know, to say, but, but to be honest, the real problem I have with the entire liberation issue is that um, sexism and racism and all kinds of prejudices aren't just about um, groups that have been historically subject to those prejudices. So I have a, I have a problem with, with, with having a, like we had here, a, a women's officer. I would far rather have an officer whose job was just to fight for liberation campaigns, whatever that might be. So I wouldn't necessarily make it just about women or just about of the LGBT community or whatever. An officer who's there to stand up for an individual's, individual's right to be respected, regardless of who they are and possibly what their lifestyle is, that's more important to me than making value judgments about what kind of liberation campaign I would want to support. It's important that it is outside my value judgments and is far more about tackling discrimination and no respect for individuals, whoever they are, rather than making a value judgment that we had here. Yep. I have a question for Michael. Yes. Uh, there's been a figure that's been quoted a lot of times about how less than 1% of the student body will vote in this election. So obviously any president who is elected will not. It will be a, a, a grossly undemocratic election. Um, so I was just wondering what you feel uh, gives you a mandate to further your own personal political uh, views using your presidency, or indeed what gives you a mandate to further anything other than promoting democracy with such an appalling democratic uh, election? Yeah, so there are two answers to that. Firstly, um, if I get elected, Yulu won't become the Michael Chesson show. The, 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 Yulu, has, Yulu, has, Yulu, has several, Yulu has several different ways of keeping officers accountable and creating policy. So you, it, won't, it won't simply be a case of me coming in and declaring all of my policies now, you know, wherever Yulu is going. Yulu has a democratic structure, which is a Senate, which has all of the presidents from across, uh, <coughs> across the University of London in it. Um, they pass policy. Most of the stuff that I've said today has been entirely in line with Yulu's already existing policy. So actually the mandate that I'm talking about in terms of, in terms of doing what, I'm, what I've put in my manifesto doesn't, doesn't require me to say, I was elected for 1% of the turnout, and therefore, you will go in one direction. Um, that's one thing. There's also a, a kind of a half answer to the side of that, which is, 
we have an election. Um, people are entitled to vote. And ultimately, you can only run an election. You, 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 you can't, if general elections, if governments behaved, uh, or, or if any form of, of people who were elected behaved, uh, on the basis of the number of people who actually voted for them in, in total, um, you would have all kinds of questions about, about stuff. And I, I, I agree, but I agree that there's a legitimacy problem there. I absolutely agree. But I also disagree that the stuff that I want to do is necessarily somehow against the will of the rest of you as it currently stands. Actually, everything that I've said pretty much is already completely in line with what you already thinks. Uh, and that, that isn't just my data in a 1% turnout election. And I agree that that's bad. And the second point is, um, yes, you, you're, you're saying that we should focus on getting democracy and, and re-democratising you. Yes, but that comes through building a culture, not simply by talking about procedures. You have to create campaigns that deal. And it, you know, not, it's not about alienating students. Who's alienated by a housing campaign that fights against high rents? If student unions exist, they exist to do to be the collective will of students, um, and that's expressed in various ways and with different different systems. But ultimately, you have to do stuff. And if you're not doing stuff, you're never going to get democracy going anywhere. Turnout will get lower if we sit here and pretend that we're all neutral. Because what is ULU if it is not what what do you elect anyone for? Why not just have a staff member? If you're not if you're not going to do if you're not actually going to propose stuff that's political. Why run an election at all? Any more specific questions, panelists? Um, this one's for Michael as well. Um, he talks about. This Michael's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, he talks about wanting to expand you with universities such as South Bank. I mean, in name at the moment, it's the un it's the union for the University of London. So I can understand that is at the moment, but. All of you have spoken about sort of it was, you know, sort of needing a revolution. I just don't understand how you can already be talking about expansion if you think that already what we've got is not value for money and in need of revolution and complete change. I don't understand how you can be talking now about expanding that to other unions. I, I don't quite understand what that is. Sure, that's a really good question, and all the problems you've highlighted are real, and there's things that we have to deal with, and it's a catch-22 because in order to make you, in order to make you lose solid financially in terms of legitimacy, it has to be relevant. But there's a problem with legitimacy and relevancy if you're not a representative union for London. Because ULU is a, is, a, is a democratic structure for the University of London. The University of London used to do a lot more things than it currently does. Um, essentially, in order to become um, what ULU can be and to be as relevant as it can, uh, ULU has to expand. Now, there's, there's a question, and you've highlighted it perfectly, about how quickly you consolidate and how quickly you expand. But what I can guarantee is that if we don't try to, if we, if we, if we sit back and simply try to consolidate, um, actually, I'm not, I'm not sure how far we'll get. Because, again, what, what is you if it's not a student union for London? Um, why, what, what, what logic does it say that, that Queen Mary and Goldsmiths in the East End are in? are in ULU, but the University of East London isn't. That is a problem. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it, it, it's the heritage of an elitist university system. And I think we have to break, I think it's our political duty to kind of try to break down those elitist barriers. But I also think in terms of like the relevancy of ULU, we have to look to expand this to be a London-wide higher education student union. Uh, and without that, without that vision, at least, we're going to have problems. Because ultimately, what's the point of view? Um, so yeah, but you're absolutely right. How quickly do we consolidate? How quickly do we expand? The two are in tandem, and you've got to calculate it and, and coordinate that really well. Right, I'm going to take one more. Uh, can we have it not for Michael or Will? <laughs> uh, quick question for the panel, just because I don't know you personally, and I don't know uh, your past experience. Uh, if you were elected, and then you're appearing, for example, on Newsnight, and you get asked the question, do you condemn violent, process, uh, violent protest? How would you answer? Um, oh, okay, interesting question. Um, yeah, that was a really unfortunate um, time.
time on Newsnight. I think it's always awkward when you've got two figures of the student protest having to basically lobby against one another, um, which is obviously massively divisive and plays completely into the media's hands when they're trying to demonise what students are doing and how, and how they're protesting. Um, I personally wouldn't, um, I wouldn't condone the students that do it, but I would condone um, the breaking of the laws and the way that they were. I don't think the students should be condemned. They were that they were angry and rightfully angry. I think that you know it was it was only you know going to happen with the amount of things that were going on. Um, I think that just condemning the students that did it would be completely wrong. We should really be making sure that they're they're cared for. And... Right. Uh, we're now going to move to uh, the closing statements for each candidate. Uh, we. Did the lots earlier, Angola, you're first. If you'd like to present your one minute closing statement, please. Um, haven't planned to put out, so we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, name's Girl, I've obviously said it before. Um, yeah, I'm running on kind of a campaign of trying to get Ulu more representative, have more of a mandate, um, needing electoral reform, constitutional reform, because the Constitution still says that we have four SABs, which we don't. Um, so there's a huge amount of stuff that needs to be changed. Um, it really hasn't been updated for a very long time. Also, um, things like, for instance, about um, having every college involved in uh, campaigns and needs having a London-wide representation. Completely agree that we should be doing that and campaigning on that on that scale, but I don't think they all have to be members of ULU to do that. I think ULU should be spearheading that movement and making a new group of student uh, of student bodies, considering the biggest student body uh, representative figures in in, in London. Uh, I think we should be leading that, but they don't have to be part of ULU to do that. So uh, yeah. <laughs> right, uh, well. um, right, one minute, so much time. Um, essentially, I, just as they start, I would completely condemn student violence. Um, I think it's an alienating thing. It goes to the heart of my campaign that I will not be a ULU president who alienates groups who aren't able or willing to come into ULU elections or union elections and take them over. Um, my campaign is very simple. I want a union that doesn't uh, stamp its views across the entirety of the student population. I want a union that facilitates and provides resources for individual students to have their own campaigns. I'm sure if I won that Michael would have an outstanding campaign against fees and cuts and he'd have a wonderful resource pool that I would facilitate for him. Um, essentially what it comes down to is for too long unions have been alienating and defending students and I will put a stop to that very simply by not having my own political agenda if I win this election, by not deciding that the views that I want to campaign for are the views that every student's pounds and pennies that come into this university union, this union building has time should be spent. Thanks. You can give me two seconds. Sorry. Yes. Bonus. 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 <laughs> I want to very quickly make the case, I mean, my, my, camp, my, my platform and my campaign is about ULU as an open, outward-looking, political campaigning organisation. Um, if ULU failed to stand up to the government on what it's doing to higher education, failed to fight for our futures, failed to campaign against discrimination and harassment on campuses, failed to campaign on housing, I would find that, and a lot of students might find that, alienating and offensive. It would be alienating and offensive for you and our democratic structures to remain neutral while we are under attack. We need, we need a ULU that will fight on those issues, and win on not, not on, not on, not on airy-fairy, fluffy stuff, but on bread and butter issues that students care about, that matter to students' lives. And when you do that, and you build it as part of a broader anti-austerity movement, you will get engagement. But we won't get engagement the other way around. Um, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, wish you were 10 times or 100 times more, but hey, and thanks for the other candidates as well. It's better to have 5 than 0 or 1, but then why not have 50? That would be an amazing hustings if there was an incredible offer for you as voters. Um, I think it's really good that we have a broad range of opinions. Um, I hope that I kind of fit somewhere amongst those rather than out there, even though I'm the only revolutionary. But the opinion that everyone in the room did. I'm the only one. Um, I'm the only one. No, I'm the only one. So um, I hope it has been reasonably entertaining. I mean, I do hope that we're not just giving you information, but actually providing you with something of uh, an enjoyable experience. And uh, thanks to the two people who have organised it as well. Chad? Uh, I'm not for a seconds. Is it really on the spot? I'm not going to steal his time. Steal away. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, just to echo, thank you very much for turning out tonight. It's good that everyone's turned up. And in essence, 
if you want to vote for me, just vote for someone who is going to do everything they possibly can to make sure that the University of London survives, that is a way is found so it's relevant to each and every institution and the people within that, and to therefore have an opportunity and a platform to go forward so we can become more self-funding, so we can actually do the things you want to do, so we can support campaigns across the board that actually are relevant to you. But make sure that you feed back to us, because you should be leading whatever we do this year, and that should be the case every year. Thank you. Okay, that draws to a close the hustings. Um, voting opens at 12 o'clock tomorrow, and we'll be running through to the next, next Friday, yeah. Yeah, to the new next Friday. Um, and the <laughs> results should be announced. Not even. Yeah, the, announced should be, the results should be announced in the evening of next Friday. So keep an eye out. You should all have emails uh, that have been sent to you with your unique uh, login for the ballot. If not, uh, get in touch with uh, or or Alex 2012, uh, the email address, and they will also go out with that. Thanks very much for signing up. Thank you to the five candidates uh, and Ben McGuire as well who sent your statement in. Um, and I hope you have a happy, happy election. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.